All right, I would like to introduce our next speaker who is going to talk to us today about breast cancer disparities. I would like to welcome Layla Noel, who is an assistant professor of social work at the NYU Silver School of so Social Work. Good morning. And thank you for having me. Dr. Joseph, thank you for the invitation. I am also very excited to be here. Please feel free to continue to breathe throughout this, <laughs> this presentation. That was lovely. Um, I, I actually feel a lot more relaxed as well, so thank you for that. Um, and it's actually nice that I actually am following the previous presenter because I'm going to tell you some stories from some um, cancer survivors today. My research is community-based, and I have spent the last seven years actually um, spending time with women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, who are um, survivors and have um, or have delayed treatment and, had, and getting started and being connected and having access to care. And so my research is very what we call qualitative in nature. Um, I, and the difference really between quantitative and qualitative is qualitative takes in a lot more stories, a lot more narratives, spending more time actually in the community. And um, I literally in St. Louis lived amongst um, in North City, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about later. Quantitative looks at more larger data, larger numbers, and, and, and percentages, which you've heard a lot about today. So today I'm going to bring it down a little bit, and I'm going to actually tell you some stories of, from some women who have experienced very um, similar experiences as some of the women in this room. So just to start off with by um, defining what health disparities are. Um, and why we are concerned about looking at disparities. So according to the National Institute of Health, health disparities are differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of disease, and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups in the United States. You've heard a lot about some of these today. We've talked about um, the previous speakers have talked a lot about genetics or financial differences or access to care or um, why is it that we see differences between African American women and um, white women and Hispanic women when it comes to um, being uh, enrolled in certain clinical trials. So you've seen a little bit of that. I'm going to talk to you about some other um, some other disparities that you may not, or reasons for the disparity that you may not have heard about as much today. So just giving you a little bit more, I don't know if you can see this, I hope you can, I can't tell from this angle if it's too light, um, but I'm just going to give you a few examples of what some of the disparities are. So I'm, I'm only going to look at a couple of these, but this is racial and ethnic health disparities among non-Hispanic African Americans compared to non-Hispanic white Americans, and this is national data. So for example, an African American is 40%, I'm trying to get this mic closer to me, maybe if I, there. Um, an African American is 40% more likely to die from stroke, 30% more likely to die from heart disease, 40% more likely to be obese, and I'll go down to diabetes, 60% more likely to be diabetic, and two times as likely to undergo a leg, foot, or toe amputation. With breast cancer, which I'm going to talk about in much more detail, um, according to this CDC um, graph, um, breast cancer, 40%, women are 40% more likely to die from their breast cancer. I'm actually going to give you a little bit more detail on that um, as we move forward. I wanted to just highlight a couple Latino pop um, disparities as well. Um, for example, um, a Latino is 45% more likely to be newly diagnosed with cervical cancer and 40% more likely to die from cervical cancer. With diabetes, 65% more likely to be diabetic, 55% more likely to have end-stage disease, and 45% more likely to die from diabetes. So this is just giving you kind of some examples of some disparity, what disparity is. When we talk about disparity, we're really talking about this. Why do we see such a difference in the prevalence of disease? So with, when it comes to breast cancer, which is why we're all here today, you've already heard this from Dr. Joseph a little bit earlier, that the incidence or 
um, diagnosis of breast cancer for African American women have caught up with um, the incidence for white women. However, um, the mortality rate for the most recent data on the mortality rate from breast cancer in African American women nationally is um, has a 42 percent higher rate of dying from her breast tumor than a white woman. This is a huge disparity that we're very concerned about. And you've heard some conversation earlier today about why we see this. Again, it's a multifaceted issue. It can be from a lot of issues that we've talked about on an individual basis to what I'm going to talk to you about, which is more society, more of a uh, overall macro type of situation. So. Reason that I look at more of a society, more of an environment um, focus to my research is because is these graphs will show you where you live makes a difference. So even though nationally an African American woman has a 42% greater chance of dying, depending on where you live, for example, in Los Angeles, she has a 71% greater chance. In Chicago, it's a 48% it's a greater chance. And in um, Houston, it's a 51% greater chance. Now in New York, you'll see here that it says, it's, it's about 19 or 20 percent. But what I want to point out to you is that depending on what neighborhood or what zip codes we look at, that can be very different. This is Manhattan or this is New York metropolitan five boroughs and not just um, looking at the different boroughs or within the boroughs at different neighborhoods. So my research that I'm going to present to you today is from St. Louis. Um, I am just um, getting connected with the wonderful research, uh, researchers here and the medical staff here, and I'm hoping to be able to do more collaborative work with this team here in the future. So today's research that I'm going to highlight in the time that I have is from the work that I've been doing for the past seven years in St. Louis. Since coming, I, I moved. I'm now on faculty here. But this graph will show you that in St. Louis, um, and I'm just going to walk over here because it's really important that I point. I know we don't have a pointer, but I want you to see. I don't know if you can see this black line here. I don't know how light it is, but this line here represents the city. This is the city of St. Louis versus the county. This in area here, if you draw a line, a straight line across, we consider this to be North St. Louis and this is South St. Louis, right? This is the Ferguson community is sitting right here on this, actually right here on this little like line right in here, okay? So this research was done in and around the first area and say that because that gives you somewhat of a cultural and um, community context to my conversation. In the St. Louis area, the red represents the highest um, mortality from breast cancer in our city. And you can see that that is sort of lumped in North City. North City is also 98 percent or greater African-American. So obviously there's something going on in these neighborhoods that is kind of compartmentalizing the disease, the mortality rate from breast cancer. I was curious about that. That's where my questions came from. And so I spent time doing what we call a community-based participatory research project. I spent five years. I lived in North City. I got my hair done in North City. I went to the store in North City. I wanted to get to know the community. I wanted to get to know the experiences of what women were going through in North City. And while I was there, I worked on several research projects. The one I'm going to present to you today was my dissertation work. And in my dissertation work, I was very interested in women who had delayed the initiation of care for breast cancer upwards of two years. Many of the women that I talked to couldn't quantify how long it, it took for them to get into care. Um, some of them said about a year, about six months. They really didn't know because they weren't really, from the time that they actually discovered the lump themselves or the pain or the blood on their bra, um, they hadn't really quantified how long that was. And then there was a huge delay between that and connecting with care or connecting with navig navigation or getting them into some type of a community, set, community center or um, patient, um, some type of a, we have a lot of like community placed health clinics around the North City area. So what I did was I spent, I interviewed some women, I spent time and I really just asked two questions because I wanted to hear from them. So I asked two questions, what was experienced and under what circumstances did they experience um, the situations that were being experienced. Today I'm gonna talk to you about the under what situations, under what circumstances 
were experienced. And the four that I'm highlighting today, and there's, there were several others to come out of this, but the four that I'm highlighting, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about each one, but social isolation, chronic traumatic events, what I call resource deserts. I'm gonna talk to you about, even though I have it on here under what it was experienced in messifying the treatment process, I'm gonna to talk to you why I'm sort of talking about under what circumstances that that was also, and then what I'm calling pride, but I'm gonna explain why, why I call it that. So the first one I wanna to talk to you about is chronic traumatic events, because chronic traumatic events sort of, um, it sort of incorporated all of the other experiences together. So what I'm calling chronic traumatic events are those things that are happening in your daily lives and have been happening for generations, because what we discovered is that the families were living within these neighborhoods, within these zip, zip codes for generations. They lived in the same, like generally like 10 block radius of where their grandmother lived or, and, and aunts and uncles lived. And so this was um, events that they had been living with for a long time. So it can be, you know, taking care of their kids and making sure they're getting to school safely and um, being able to take care of maybe a sick parent or working a couple, two or three jobs or, you know, just being present for the family. It can be a lot of issues of having their own chronic um, diseases other than like diabetes or heart disease other than the cancer. So there's like a lot of things that are going on or um, having a, when somebody had a spouse who was home on disability leave and so taking care of that person, there were a lot of things that were happening that for lack of a better term, I call chronic traumatic events because these are things that are ongoing throughout in the community. So this is just one quote from one of the women that I interviewed. And again, these pictures are not actually the pictures of the women that I interviewed for their um, confidentiality. I've just used um, stock photos, but I have worked really hard to make sure my boys are not caught up in what's happening out there. You know what I mean? They're, they are in school and doing well. If I am too sick to keep up with them, who else will? I just don't know. So again, these are reasons why the women were explaining to me why they delayed um, connecting with healthcare and, and assistance. Another woman talked about what I call pride in the safety and stability um, wait, pride in the safety and stability they have achieved in their homes and a desire to transfer this success to the patient provider relationship. So they, I'm just gonna read the quote first and then I'll explain. I thought it might have been stress and all that I had to deal with on a daily basis. I knew it was something, but I never thought it was cancer. They wanted to know from me, how could you have taken a bath every day and not notice that you had tumors protruding through your skin? I said, my kids are fed and clean every day. I get them to school on time. My house is clean. I take care of my grandmother and I work full time. I was able to pay my bills and take care of my kids. By the time I got in the bathroom to take care, to take a bath, it would be 10 o'clock. I would jump in, shower, and literally almost pass out being so tired because I worked full time. So I didn't pay any attention to my own health because I was responsible for four other people. And further in the discussion with this um, person who was sharing her story with me, what she was saying to me is that she kind of wanted this, this sort of, this, this pride in, in the fact that she had provided such stability for her home in the conversation with the team that was taking care of her. And she felt like they were, by saying to her, how could you have let this go on for so long that they were discrediting all the the work she's done to keep her home life and her children's life stable. And so I think it just takes a little bit of, and from her perspective, it just takes a little bit of us recognizing that there are things outside of the um, patient provider relate conversation that's actually influencing um, their decision to move forward with care. And just acknowledging that was really a lot of what the women were hoping for. Another is social isolation. I found this one to be very interesting in that a lot of the women that I interviewed, they had a social network. They had family, they had a church environment, they had friends, but they didn't tell anyone that they were in pain. They didn't tell anyone that they, um, even after being diagnosed, they didn't tell anyone that they had cancer. Um, and they kind of kept it to themselves. And a lot of times it was like, well, especially with the adult children, you know, 
they're, they have their own lives. I don't want them to worry about me. I should be able to do this. Um, sometimes it was more of like, I just don't want anyone to know. I don't know why this happened to me. And so I think some of it might have been a communication issue that it, 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 it can be cancer doesn't mean you've done something wrong because you've been diagnosed with this. Um, so I'll just read a couple quotes that I highlighted here. I told no one. I told my parents I was having a procedure and asked if the kids could stay with them for a few weeks. It was summer break and they were out of school, but I didn't tell them it was cancer. Another person said, some people are embarrassed and ashamed and scared of what might happen um, if they get treated, treatment and don't want nobody to know, cause I did. Your self-worth is gone. I really felt like that, I really did. And another different person said, they hide it, they act worse with that, meaning cancer, than gonorrhea. They think it's taboo to have it. So just sort of demystifying some of these, that it's okay to talk about it, that it's okay <laughs> that you're not in this alone and that um, it doesn't mean you've done something wrong. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight another, um, this idea of demystifying the process of treatment. This idea that a lot of the women were saying it's not so much the diagnosis that they were Get, being diagnosed with cancer that they were afraid of. And I, I actually the woman who spoke about survivorship earlier, her list was amazing because a lot of the things that I heard from the women that I talked to um, pre-treatment for treatment delay was in her list of the things that survivors were worried about. And these things that she was listing were the things that was delaying them from connecting with care because they were worried about who's gonna help take care of my kids. What if I'm too sick to take care of my kids? What if I'm too sick to work? Will I lose my job? These were all things that were causing them to delay connecting with care um, because they were unfamiliar with what was going to happen during the treatment process. So if we could do um, a better job of explaining and demystifying that treatment process, not so much that you, they have cancer, but just what's going to happen now, then I think that would also connect them with the resources that are available to help with some of the things that they are concerned about. And that's, I think, where the patient navigation program comes in that you're going to hear a lot about coming up, I think, um, after the break. Because patient navigation does a really great job of um, connecting people with the resources that are available to sort of address a lot of the things that they are concerned about that may be delaying treatment, delaying um, um, help, seeking help behavior as well. And so while a lot of times we are looking at patient navigation when it comes to screening, increasing mammography use, Patient navigation is also the, the, the tools and the information that is used through patient navigation is also quite helpful with, connect, with decreasing time to care for women who are in a lot of um, socially isolated communities. And just to highlight a couple of ways that I think that our patient navigation program could be even expanded upon even more than already the, the wonderful things that they do is to start with these messages of it's okay to talk about it by using women of color to share their experiences with treatment with other women of color. In St. Louis, we ended up having a panel. We had a, a town hall meeting for North City where we brought together, it was very similar to what we're doing here um, um, in, right in North City at one of the local churches. And we brought the community together to hear about some of the findings that we had. And we had a panel of survivors who participated in the study to talk to the women about their experiences and that it's okay to talk about it. Um, a second would be focusing on this idea of demystifying the process of treatment rather than just on that you're, you have cancer. And then finally, increasing communication between clinical settings and community-based agencies in an effort to increase the availability of resource information to socially isolated communities. It's so hard to get information into communities that are isolated you need to have partners within those communities to be able to get the word out and to change the messaging. And that's something that we also do. We partner with community agencies to try and change the messaging or at least connect people with the resources and the information that they need in order to know that we do have services available to um, address some of their fears. So I just wanted to say that, I'll say thank you.